welcome to Project Ascension's Ascended Karazhan Guide. In this video, we'll be going over each boss within Karazhan, discussing all key mechanics and how to optimally handle them. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to like and leave a comment down below. The first boss we will encounter is Midnight. Midnight will have two phases. In phase one, you'll have your main tank taunt Midnight and have your off tank taunt a Tumen. Midnight will do a knockdown stun and a Tumen will apply a stacking armor debuff. During this phase, you do not need to worry about tank swapping. The damage between these two bosses separate is negligible. Your DPS and healers will need to watch out for green fire that is placed around the map. Once Midnight has reached 25% health, a Tumen will mount Midnight starting phase two. The boss will now have both a Tumen's and Midnight's mechanics. The main tank will start getting a stacking armor debuff and will be periodically stunned. On top of this, Midnight has three more mechanics to focus on. The first is for tanks. Midnight will charge the furthest target away from him roughly every 30 seconds. To handle this, have your tank placed in the back of the map. Make sure none of your ranged DPS or healers are further away from the boss than the, the tank is. Keep your off tank in the far back corner of the ring so that the charges don't hit any of your raid members. Tanks will want to taunt swap after every second charge. This should be around three stacks of armor debuff. Someone in the raid team will require to dispel curse. As the boss will apply a raid-wide curse, this will reduce all raid members' hit chance and needs to be dispelled as soon as possible. During this fight, we use two people to dispel in group 1 and group 2, but do what works best for your raid team. Lastly, phantom horses will spawn running through the arena. If hit, it will deal AoE damage around it, so keep the range spread out to avoid too much AoE damage if someone does get hit. Continue to repeat these mechanics until midnight is dead. The next boss is Morose. Before the fight starts, if you have Shackle Undead or any other form of crowd control, you will want to trap Lady Katrina and Baron Rafe. Pull the boss away so that your AoE does not break any of the crowd control that was set up. You will need to have someone keep an eye on the CC timers so that you can reapply them in the middle of the fight. You will want to focus down Baroness Dorothea first and then Lord Cripson. Make sure you have kicks ready when Dorothea casts heal. Keep the mob stacked so that your raid group can cleave Morose. During this fight, Morose will vanish using Blind, Gouge, or Garrote on a target. If someone gets blind, make sure to use Dispel Poison to remove the CC right away. The hardest mechanic during this phase that the whole raid will need to be aware of is Dance. Every so often, Phantoms will appear around a raid member, and after a few seconds explode, dealing arcane damage and applying a stacking debuff that increases overall arcane damage. Make sure to avoid this stacking debuff at all costs. For DPS and healers, you don't want to go above 5 stacks. Once the first two adds are dead, you can pull down the remaining two adds and focus down Lady Katrina, making sure to kick her heals and using abilities such as Tranquilizing Shot, Spell Steal, or Purge to remove Power Word Shield when applied. Once all the adds are dead, it's time to focus on Morose. When Morose reaches 70% health, he will enter Phase 2. During Phase 2, all Phase 1 mechanics are still in effect. However, you will now receive a Stacking Starving debuff when dinner is served. You will need to find your corresponding food on one of the four tables. Tanks and healers should take prio in this. Having one healer or tank find their food first, then swapping doing callouts if someone is struggling to find their food. If you can't find your food at all, keep in mind that the food changes in a specific order, which is boar, fish, apple, wine, orange. Eating the wrong food will give you a stacking debuff. It is okay to eat one or two of the wrong food if you're in desperate need for the correct food. Once Morose reaches 25%, two adds will spawn. You will need to crowd control them or have a tank as well as someone that can kick focus the ads so that they do not cast heal on Morose. It is very important to keep an eye out for this as in within a few seconds of spawning they can quickly heal Morose back up to 40% health which can lead to a wipe. During this fight keep the boss in the center and move to the sides as you need to to avoid the dance. The next boss we want to look at is Maiden. For Maiden, I suggest if you're starting out to go with three healers. However, this fight is doable with two healers if you can meet the high HPS requirements. Maiden has five mechanics your raid team will need to be careful of. First is Holy Ground. All ranged DPS will want to be out of range of Maiden's Holy Ground, as this applies a stacking debuff that will silence the target if it reaches max stack. Next is Holy Fire. Maiden will pick a target in the raid team and cast Holy Fire on them. This will apply a ticking damage dot on the target. Healers will need to heal through this damage. Thirdly, Maiden will use Holy Wrath on a target, bouncing to any nearby allies within 10 yards, doing increased damage for each additional target hit. 
This ability can easily wipe raids. For this, you're going to want to have the raid team spread out. During our 10 mans, we paired people up into groups of two and had them stay 10 yards away from other groups to avoid spreading Holy Wrath. Maiden will then use Repentance. Before Repentance goes off, all ranged DPS that are not affected by Holy Ground will need to step in and take one stack of Holy Ground to break the CC. It is important not to step in too early as she will sometimes cast Holy Wrath within a second before she casts Repentance, capable of wiping the entire raid. Lastly, Maiden will use Desperate Prayer, which will knock the whole raid back, then deal massive AoE damage to the whole raid for 6 seconds, and applying a debuff that will deal 1 million damage if not cleansed. To cleanse this debuff, you'll have the whole raid group up and get knocked into the left fountain. Then, have one of your healers use an AoE healing cooldown, such as Tranquility. If you are using Tranquility, you'll need 2 healers with Trank, or a healing touch healer with a Trank cooldown reduction. The whole raid group will want to rotate clockwise to the next fountain and repeat this process until Maiden is killed. Maiden is one of the most difficult bosses in the raid and is skippable, so if you feel like you can't do this boss, head to Opera Event. Opera Event will have three different events, each with their own unique mechanics to deal with. However, all three will share one mechanic, which is Spotlight. You will need to have the whole raid group and stack in the Spotlight, and after a few seconds, you will be told to not press a certain spell. If you press this spell, you will gain a debuff that will reduce your stats and place a green cloud on the floor, dealing damage to anyone standing within it. The first type of event that you might get is Little Red Riding Hood. This is the easiest fight. The only mechanic is the Big Bad Wolf will target someone at random and fixate. You need to run away from the boss during this time. If you're a melee, it's good to step away preemptively so you don't get one shot. If a spotlight spawns while you are being chased, do not stand in the spotlight. The big bad wolf will also do an AoE fear, so tremor totems can help. The next event is Romeo and Juliet. In phase one, you'll fight Juliet. She will cast three different types of spells, eternal affections, powerful attraction, and blinding passion. The kick order for this should be internal affection, then power attraction, and then blinding passion. Once you defeat Juliet, phase two will start. Romeo will do a cleave in front of him, so keep the boss facing away from the raid. Once Romeo is defeated, phase three will start. You will have to fight both Romeo and Juliet at the same time. They use the same mechanics, so keep kicks on Juliet. You will need to kill both bosses within 10 seconds of each other. Otherwise, they will be rezzed back up to full health. Lastly, we have the Wizard of Oz. In phase one, you're going to be facing Dorothy, Strawman, Tinhead, Tito, and Roar. Dorothy will cast Waterbolt on a random target. Tito will focus on a random target. Strawman will deal moderate single target damage. Tinhead will do cleave damage in front of him, so make sure to keep him faced away from the raid group. Roar will do an AoE fear, so Tremor Totem is excellent here. The focus order should be Roar, Tito, Tinhead, Strawman, then Dorothy. Once phase one is complete, you'll enter phase two, where the crone will spawn. She has two main abilities, Chain Lightning, which deals damage bouncing up to five targets. Try to keep the raid spread out as much as possible. However, the damage is very healable. The other one is Cyclone. These will spawn every so often, chasing random raid members, knocking them up in the air. We found the best way to do this when too many Cyclones start to spawn is to have one tank stand on each side of the stage and taunt the boss away when too many Cyclones start to stack up. Repeat this process until the boss is dead. It is very important to save Bloodlust for this phase of the fight. The next optional boss will be Nightbane. Nightbane has two phases and has a high healing check. You'll only need one tank in this fight. In phase one, Nightbane has three mechanics. Flame Breath. This will deal damage in the frontal cone of the boss. Make sure to keep the boss facing away from the raid. Curse, a debuff that is applied to all raid members. This will need to be dispelled. However, when it is dispelled, it will deal massive AoE damage to the raid. You'll want to dispel this slowly, making sure that the raid is topped up before dispelling the next one. Popping a healing cooldown like Trank is wise. You will have one minute to complete this. The last ability is Charred Earth. Charred Earth will spawn under a random raid member. Have the range stacked as one. This will help control the placement and allow you to save as much space as possible since the pools will not disappear. Slowly move the boss across the map as the fight continues. In phase two, Nightbane will fly in the air, summoning skeletons and dealing raid-wide damage. During this phase, stack up on the tank and do AoE damage. Make sure the tank grabs threat and brings the boss back into position during the transition phase of phase one and phase two. Nightbane will go into phase two at 75, 50, and 25% health. The next raid boss that you'll face is the Curator. The Curator has two phases. During phase one, tanks will need to make sure that they have the highest threat. 
as the curator will deal damage to the person with the highest and second highest threat. Every so often, the curator will spawn astral flares, which will deal AoE damage to the raid. It is important that all DPS focus hard on these mobs as they spawn. Roughly every 20 seconds, the curator will cast Do Not Touch the Display on two targets. You will want both targets to go outside of the raid group. You are able to avoid this damage altogether if you move away after the spell has been cast. These mechanics will happen until the curator begins to cast Evocation, which will begin phase two. During phase two, the curator will gain mana and health per second. To avoid this, you will need to destroy one of the four display cases around the boss. To do this, stand behind one of the display cases while he is casting Do Not Touch the Displays on you. The timing for this is when he is around 20% mana or about 30 to 25 seconds before he is going to cast Evocation shown on your DBM. Doing this applies a debuff to the curator, now allowing you to deal massively increased damage to him. If you are playing a snapshot DPS, this is when you want to use your snapshot. Repeat this process until 15%. At 15%, the curator will stop going into phase two. He will also deal increased magic damage to the tanks. This is where you'll want to cast Bloodlust to burn the boss down as fast as possible. Keep in mind to have your tanks use any defensive cooldowns that they need during this phase. The next boss, which is also optional, is Ilhuf. Ilhuf has two phases. During phase one, he'll have an imp named Kelric with him. Keep Ilhuf and Kelric stacked together near the middle of the map, focusing on Kelric. You will want to have one of your tanks stand in the back of the room. This is where two portals will open up, summoning fiendish imps. These imps will apply a stacking debuff called Amplifying Flames. Increasing fire damage taken. Do not kill the fiendish imps while Calric is alive. Doing this will heal the boss, so it is important you keep the boss away from the fiendish imps to avoid cleave. It is suggested to give the tank fire resistance gear if they are struggling with the imps. This gear can be purchased from the badge vendor. Ilhuf will cast Sacrifice on a random raid target. The whole raid team will need to switch targets and focus down demon chains as soon as it spawns. Once demon chains and Calric are down, Phase 2 begins. You want to move the boss over to the fiendish imps and have the DPS kill the imps. Once Kelrek is resummoned, you want to repeat Phase 1 until the boss is dead. This boss does not have a best time to use Bloodlust. I would suggest Bloodlusting at the start or saving it for an emergency cooldown later in the fight. The next fight is the Shade of Aran. This fight can be done with only one tank. During Phase 1, Shade of Aran will choose a target at random and cast one of the following spells. Frostbolt, Fireball, Arcane Missiles, Chain of Ice, and Multi-Target Counterspell. The first three spells can be ignored. However, you will want to dispel magic anyone that gets Chains of Ice, and range will want to stay at least 10 yards away from the boss to avoid the AoE Counterspell. Shade of Ron will also rotate randomly between four different abilities. These are roughly on a 30 second cooldown. Circular Blizzard. Shade of Ron summons a moving blizzard around the outer edge of the room. That goes clockwise. It'll deal the high amount of damage and slow anyone hit. Make sure to move out of this right away. Flame Wreath. Shade of Aran will place a ring of fire around raid members. If anyone moves while within the circle, it'll do massive raid damage, easily leading to a wipe. When this is being cast, it is wise to stop moving altogether. Charged Arcane Explosion. Shade of Aran will pull everyone to him, applying a slow and an AoE silence on half of the raid. The whole raid will need to reach the outer edge of the room to avoid the one-shot mechanic. Magic Dispels and any form of slow removal are great uses here. It is important to know that the Shade of Aran can and will still cast Chains of Ice during this mechanic and needs to be removed instantly. Volatile Polymorph. Shade of Aran will cast Polymorph on half of the raid group. This Polymorph is only breakable by running into a poly target. Before this goes off, have your range paired up so that the Polymorph will instantly break. Make sure not to stack too much as if multiple explosions go off on the same group it can wipe the raid. When Shade of Aran hits around 1.1 million mana, he will polymorph the whole raid and conjure water that he will drink, refilling his mana pool. Once this is done, he will cast an AoE fireball hitting the whole raid. Using a healing cooldown such as Trank is great here. At 40% health, Shade of Aran will summon four water elementals. These need to be focused and killed right away. Melee DPS need to be careful if Summon Blizzard gets cast during this phase. This is a good time to use Bloodlust if you're having a hard time keeping the raid up during this damage. At 20%, Shade of Aran will enter Phase 2. He will gain a buff where he takes 99% reduced damage for 1 minute. The raid group will want to stack up on top of Aran. He will summon arcane beams around the room. Most of the time, he will leave room for the raid group to stand. After each explosion, three mana worms will spawn. Focus these down in between the arcane beams. If you get a full room, you will need to move to the northern table of the room. Arcane beams will either start on the left or right side of the table. You will want to stack on the opposite side of where it started. So when the first arcane beam explodes, the raid will move to the other side. 
The next optional boss is Nether Spite. Nether Spite is a two-phase fight. During phase one, Nether Spite will spawn four portals. The raid will require a raid member to soak each of these beams. Each beam provides a different Nether portal buff. Normally, you want healers to grab green, tanks to grab red, and DPS to grab blue. Lastly, you'll want a ranged DPS to grab purple. During phase one, Nether Spite will also place void zones on the ground dealing shadow damage. Make sure to move out of these. They will increase in size during the duration of the fight. Ideally, you'll want to try and keep the boss on a certain side of the room to keep void zones close together and having the boss facing away from the main room. After a minute of beams, phase one will end and you will get a debuff preventing you from soaking the next beam. You will not get a debuff for soaking the purple portal. You will need to rotate who is soaking which beam for the next phase one. Phase two will now begin. The raid group will want to spread out avoiding mana orbs that will explode. You can tell when they are about to explode as they will turn red. Nether Spite will cast Nether Breath, hitting anyone in a cone towards the boss. It'll also target anyone within 200 yards for heavy damage and knocking them back. Currently, if you taunt the boss while he is casting this, you can interrupt it. However, it is unsure if this is intentional or not. The ranged DPS that soaked the purple portal will now want to stand on top of the void zones, shrinking them down in size. You will have 30 seconds to do this. Void zones will vanish every second phase two. At the end of phase two and at the start of phase one, the tank will need to locate the red portal immediately and position himself correctly between the beam and the boss, ideally keeping the boss on the other side of the room to ensure you have room to avoid the void zones. The next fight is the chessboard. Honestly, this fight is straightforward. All you want to do is have your units focus down the enemy king. It is important to have the right pieces in the right places though. For Rooks, you want to have them within three squares of the King, dealing AoE damage to all units. Bishops want to control the center behind other units healing. Knights, Queen, and King can rush the enemy King. The only thing to be careful about is to make sure the King is not the first one into the fight, as you don't want it to be focused down, as if the King dies, you lose. The only other mechanic to be careful about is Medieval attempt to cheat in the middle of the fight, placing down fire. Just move your units out of the fire and you'll be perfectly fine. Prince Melchizar has three phases. During phase one, Prince has four abilities to watch out for. Summon Infernal. Prince will summon an Infernal. This tends to be between the tank and the range group. The Infernal will spam Hellfire around it. Shadow Word Pain. This will be casted on a random target. Make sure to dispel this right away as this will deal a lot of magic damage if left unchecked. Enfeeble. This is casted on three random raid members, changing their max health to one. Any damage will cause death. You will need to move away from the boss when he casts Shadow Nova. Shadow Nova is the last ability Prince will cast. It'll deal moderate shadow damage to all targets within 25 yards and knock them back. If you have Enfeeble, make sure that you are not in the range of this spell. During phase one, you will want to move the boss around the rim of the map, neatly keeping the infernals on the outer edge and as close as possible to each other. Start by the door and go clockwise as so. At 70%, phase two will begin. Prince will gain four new abilities. Sunder Armor will apply a 10% armor reduction onto the tank. You'll want to taunt swap around three stacks. Cleave. Prince will also now cleave in front of him, so make sure to keep melees on behind the boss. Doom. Prince channels for a second, casting Doom, dealing damage in a line towards an active Infernal, destroying the Infernal. Into the Shadow Realm. Random raid members will be put into the Shadow Realm. You will need to click three shards to be brought back into the physical plane. When phase two starts, Prince will instantly cast Doom, destroying all existing Infernos. It is important to keep your raid team positioned away from the Infernals so that none of them get hit by Doom. Infernals operate differently in phase two. Once Prince casts Doom on an Infernal, a new Infernal will not spawn in the same spot for a long while. You will want Prince to place three Infernals in these spots. Then, moving back to this wall after he's destroyed the first two Infernals, after this is done, you can keep him in place. Depending on your DPS, you might have to move him once before hitting phase three. If you are put into the Shadow Realm, you will want to make sure to kill all the adds here before leaving. They will pull targets around the map, making it difficult to click the shards and can greatly hinder healers or tanks. Make sure to communicate with your raids so you know where it's safe to leave the Shadow Realm. I suggest assigning markers to sides so it's for easy callouts. At 30%, Prince will enter phase three. This is when you want to use Bloodlust as you want to burn the boss as fast as possible. You will begin to summon Infernals much faster and randomly. Keep doing the same mechanics as you have been, moving the boss around to safe spots when you can. 